Right across the street from the Jacob Javits Center where the American Psychiatric Association is holding its annual meeting. I don't believe most people would have a problem with psychiatry if it really took the time to sit with a person to find out what happened in someone's life that led to their depression or anxiety or their thoughts of suicide or violence. But that's not how it's done by most psychiatrists today. Today, it's a matter of a few minutes giving a diagnosis from a manual that many of us believe is, has no basis in science and then given a prescription. The trouble is there's no long-term follow-up to see what is the impact of that pharmaceutical model upon your behavior. We've been led to believe that almost all of our problems today, from bipolar to ADD and ADHD, are due to brain chemical imbalances. Show us the proof. There's a lot that needs to be challenged within psychiatry. And unless we go out and do the challenging, it won't challenge itself. There's no self-monitoring. There, no, there is no council of responsible men and women. There's no council of medical elders. There's no wise men and women who are saying, we have done a lot of damage and we're not scientific. But I believe we must be here. We must stand up for those who have been abused with electroconvulsive therapy, lobotomies, forced medication, restraint, even a form of kidnapping. It's going on all the time. We are not a nation that suddenly finds that every behavior can be pathologized. Social anxiety disorder, authority defiance disorder, are these really uniquely original conditions that impact our brain? I think not. I think these are nothing more than pathologizing normal behavior in order to sell medications. And shame on the pharmaceutical companies, and shame on the government regulators, and shame on the FDA and the CDC and the National Institute of Mental Health, and shame on the American Psychiatric Association for not having the decency to allow those of us who have knowledge and are scientific in to dialogue with them. Why are we here today? To stop psychiatric oppression. Yes, my name is Leah Harris and I am a survivor. I am a survivor of psychiatric abuse and trauma. This started with my parents. My parents died largely as a result of terrible psychiatric practice that took them when they were young adults and struggling with experiences they didn't understand. They were labeled with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. My parents were turned from people with dreams and ambitions into patients, permanent patients who suffered the indignities of forced treatment, electroshock, involuntary commitment, and a shocking amount of disabling heavy duty psychiatric drugs. And as a result, they died early from a combination of over-medication and broken spirits. And I'm an orphan today because of psychiatry. I'm here because I too was almost made into a permanent patient. I entered the mental health system as a girl, traumatized by the painful experiences that I had had with my mother in a hostile world. Thank God I escaped the mental health system at age 18 when I decided I would not be left to rot in a filthy group home eating food that was not suited for dogs. And as hopeless as I was, something inside me said I was deserving of a better future. Psychiatry and the mental health system were not going to give it to me. I would have to find it on my own. Yes, we protest at the APA today, but this is bigger than psychiatry. This is about the way we treat the most deeply suffering people in our society. I give psychiatry a failing grade. I give the mental health system a failing grade. Not only are they not helping people, as Jim said and others said, they are killing them. We need a sort of truth and reconciliation commission like they had in South Africa, Rwanda, and elsewhere. It's time for you, members of the APA, to be honest about pharma's undue influence in the kind of quote-unquote medicine you practice. 
Be honest about seclusion and restraint, forced hospitalization, electroshock, and forced medication, which have no place in mental health care. They are merely a reflection of your inability to actually help people beyond labeling, drugging, shocking, and locking them up. Whatever you are up to in there is a farce. When such human rights violations are occurring on a regular basis under your care, let's come together as people who've all been victims of a barbaric mental health system and figure out how we can affect change. And until you do, until you join us as equals in the struggle for human rights and social justice, join us to create real community supports that meet the real needs of real people. We will be here speaking out. And we are winning, and we will win. After the revolution, historians and anthropologists will study our time and say how barbaric that these things used to happen in healthcare. The mental health system was so backward. We're so glad we're more enlightened now. We will see this day. And love to all of you who carry on the struggle for peace and justice. Thank you. Today, we don't rely upon a council of elderly. To the contrary, the older you get, the less relevant you are in our society today. So we do not respect innate wisdom. We do not look at nature as part of the answer. Instead, we say, within seven minutes, you have a diagnosis. It is a brain chemical imbalance, and we have a pharmaceutical that will help correct that. Fine. I have no problem with that if it were true and if it worked. But it's not true, because when confronting psychiatrists, and we simply ask them, can you show us the peer review literature, some double-blind, placebo-controlled study, that a brain chemical imbalance exists that proves that ADHD, or bipolar, or any depression or anxiety is impacted by this, and what is the proof that your drug will help? They have no evidence. To the contrary, they will say, honestly frequently, well, it's all subjective. Again, I have no problem with saying that all psychiatric diagnoses are subjective. Then do what is least harmful, because that means if your diagnosis is subjective, your treatments are also subjective. So why would you give a drug that is known to cause suicidal ideation in a person where you could give a sugar tablet and get the same results as far as the depressive symptoms? I would rather take a sugar pill than something that would cause me to blow up my brains. Yes. Yes. And yet, instead of erring on the side of caution, the science actually shows that for the for minor and, and, and common depression, there is no benefit of a drug over a sugar pill. Yet, there is a difference. Sugar costs about 11 cents a pound. An antipsychotic goes for about $10,000 a pound. Now, we don't mind people making a legitimate profit, but I don't want to see anyone profit when the cost is human life and suffering. That is immoral. That's unethical. Why can't we bring ethics and morality to a profession that abrogated it when it saw that it didn't have to concern itself with the results? You can't take back your diagnosis in psychiatry, right. nor can you take back the electroconvulsive therapy, right. nor the lobotomy, the chemical lobotomy with Prozac, Thorazine. You can't take back the lives that were, were lost at Columbine when the young man was normal and still, instead, in, until he started taking a high dose of antidepressants. Right. Why was it that when we interviewed the teachers and the students in Columbine, they said, Eric Harris was normal until he got on the meds, and then he went nuts. It was all about the guns. But it's not about the guns. It's about the state of mind that a drug will put you in. What do we know? We know that all mass killings in the last 25 years have been 90, 95% of people are on psychiatric meds. Instead of exploring the meds first, we immediately attribute the violence to the guns. So. We're right back to where we started. My concern is that people enter medicine for noble reasons. My concern is the patients go to doctors because they know that they want to help them get well. My concern is 
that the doctor's not helping the patient and the patient's not helping themselves with the current model. We need a new holistic approach in mental health care. We need to bring back holism and nature because I will show you when patients are given time and respect and counseling and you detoxify them and you show that they were gluten tolerant and dairy tolerant and you can create brain fatigue and brain allergies and suddenly an otherwise normal person acts out when they're on a stimulant because we never thought that the brain could be allergic. It is. You can have brain allergies that can cause depression, anxiety. I recently counseled a young man. He was on two meds and his father said he's got ADHD and now they want to give him a third med. I asked a simple question. I said, are there any teachers you like? He said, yeah, there are three teachers I like. And he don't like, he said, I don't like the other. I said, what do you get in the classes where you like to teach? I get A's. What do you get when you don't like to teach your class? Right. I fail. Right, right, right. Is there anything you do outside of school you like? Yeah, I like soccer. Anything you don't like? Yeah, I don't like homework. <laughs> now keep in mind, could you imagine no teacher, the school psychologist, the psychiatrist, no one caught the fact that you cannot have episodic ADHD. In other words, you can't be normal in the classes you like right. and abnormal in the classes you don't like. <laughs> normal when you're out playing and not normal when you're asked to do homework. Normal when you don't like doing the dishes and abnormal, you see, this is how it works. If you have a true brain chemical damage state, it is all the time, 24 seven. And yet, if we detoxified as this kid did, the individuals, put him on a healthy diet. You got rid of dairy, gluten, sugar, artificial sweeteners, and caffeine. You took the damn cell phone away. So you're not sleeping with it, creating electromagnetic pulses in the brain. If you got him away from their computer, if you got him outside in nature, if you got him to talk with an elder, a grandfather, grandmother, an aunt or uncle that actually understands what it is to be a kid and has time for them, then maybe they wouldn't need one of these individuals across the street. Right, 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 right. Look, when you and I were growing up, no kid committed suicide. That's right. Today, the number one cause of death in 10 to 14 year olds is suicide. Right. We didn't have autism. It wasn't because we didn't know how to diagnose it. Yep. If we missed diagnosing autism when we grew up, then we'd have an entire adult generation of autism today. We don't. Do you realize how many people would be in this street if every victim of psychiatric abuse was here today? The entire city would be lying from one end to the other. And by the way, you have a man here who single-handedly took on Big Pharma when no one else had the courage to. And there's a drug called Diprexa. He was the one who got them to admit that they were guilty. They lied. $1.2 billion fine. Now, if you or I commit a crime and we hurt people, we are monitored for life. Those same people then go right into the White House to write the Medicare rules to write Obamacare, nothing happens to them. When you have one drug that kills 60,000 Americans, what is that one drug? Biox. Six, yes, 60,000 Americans died. More Americans died in four years from taking that drug than all of American casualties in Vietnam War. They paid a $4.85 billion fine. The head of the company got a raise and the stock went up. Only in America could you kill 60,000 Americans and get a raise. That's just bad. He, he, brought him to their, he brought him to task, but we need more people to be whistleblowers. Come forward, tell the truth. We need more of you to stand up and say no. We need more of you to re-empower yourselves. Thank you all very much. Let me tell you that 25 years ago today, I organized a similar protest at the APA meeting in New York City. We were only 12 mothers. It was Mother's Day at that time. We were 12 mothers and one male. That particular meeting was the launching pad for clozapine, the first of the so-called atypical neuroleptics, which they call antipsychotics. They, the APA promoted the drug 
as a scientific breakthrough in the treatment of schizophrenia. Those drugs, though, as we all know now, and there are so many of them, the Zyprexa and Risperdal and Seroquel, and they keep on coming. Those drugs are both unsafe and untherapeutic. They have produced terrible, irreparable damage to the body and the brain of those who have ingested them for any length of time. It started with schizophrenia. It is now being prescribed for little children and the elderly. They're killing them and they know it because now not just the Zyprexa documents, but all of these trials, the science, quote unquote, we see that it's corrupt. It's been corrupted because it was all done for pharmaceutical marketing purposes. There are no cures in psychiatry. Even some psychiatrists have begun to turn back a doctor who was one of the formulator of the DSM-4, the Diagnostic Manual, Psychiatry's Bible, so to speak, he had, in fact, helped launch the ADHD epidemic, and now he's doing a mea culpa. He's attacking the new DSM-5, as well he should, but he hasn't fully come through. In other words, when he hears me say it, then he gets very upset. Oh, no, no, psychiatry is wonderful. But he has written and spoken up against the new drugging and the new diagnoses that are being given to children. Essentially, the APA Diagnostic Manual, which is their practice manual, it is designed to increase the number of people who are diagnosed with a mental illness which can then be treated with drugs. The newest drugs, the most toxic drugs, the better. How long will this go on? I have to tell you that I am very happy to see a much bigger crowd than 25 years ago when we were just 13. However, at that time, we actually were able to barge in on the meeting. You can't do that anymore. You can't get near them, not 100 feet away. At that time, we could still do that and get some press to cover it. But they have gotten worse and worse and more daring and have state agencies helping them. The, that, the case of Justine Pelletier. The, The case of Justine Pelletier, Justina, that sends, it should send shivers through the spines of American families. This is a child who came in with a medical condition, was treated by a prominent physician at Tufts Medical Center. He recommended that the parents take her to Boston Children's Hospital because of intestinal problems and he wanted a very special specialist to treat her. She was abdicated. She was kidnapped by the psychiatrist at the hospital and put into a locked psych cell. What right do psychiatrists have to abduct children? Well, I'll tell you what, because the psychiatrists blamed the parents, they reported the parents as child abusers. And the Department of Children and Families came in and convinced a judge within 24 hours to remove that child permanently from the custody of their parents. That story needs to be told all over America. There was, that child was given a cocked up diagnosis I can't even remember the name because nobody even uses it, but it essentially means it's made up, it's in the mind. Well, the child is now in a wheelchair. Yes. They took her off her medicines, her therapeutic medicines for which she was being treated. How long will this go on? 
How long will this go on? What we need is that every person in Congress should have a child at risk that way. They should be screened and drugged the same way as other children. I can't. Anyway, I'd like to give the floor to someone else. Thanks, Vera. Free Justina. Last year, I talked about how psychiatry is a fraudulent enterprise. This year, I want to talk about how psychiatry is a criminal enterprise. Psychiatry has literally killed millions of people with, with no real benefit. What is it when someone kills? It's, it is, it's murder. There's a recent book by Peter Gocha called uh, Deadly Medicine, Organized Crime, where he, he said, and he, was, he is one of the founders of the Cochrane Collaboration, which goes through and examines the uh, medical literature to find out how, really, how fraudulent it is or how good it is. Um, and he, he concurs that it's, it's murder. But really, we've been saying that for a long time. Uh, so, number one, murder. There's not any more heinous crime than murder. The United Nations, the Special Rapporteur on uh, Torture, has held, has found that involuntary commitment which is really psychiatric imprisonment, let's not mince words, and forced drugging can constitute torture, is torture. Well, that happens millions of times a year. That's a crime. Okay, and, and Lauren, who just introduced me in her dissertation, Devoiced, also yeah. talks about our newly minted PhD, Lauren Tenney. Yeah. that psychiatrists must be held a accountable. Psychiatry must be held accountable. <laughs> Who are some of the people that have been murdered? Little children. Rebecca Riley, two years old when she was started on, on neuroleptics. I don't call them antipsychotics. They don't have antipsychotic principles for many. They're neuroleptics, they're brain toxins, they're chemical lobotomies. Yep. That's the so-called, that's what they call the therapeutic effect. Yep. Rebecca Riley was started on these drugs when she was two and dead by four. What happened to the psychiatrist who prescribed them? She got immunity from prosecution so they could convict her parents of murder. Esmond Green. The only reason we know about Esmond Green is her death by psychiatry was caught on film. She was in the emergency room for, what, 24 hours without being seen, collapsed, and people, the staff just walked by. One person even kicked her. So I wrote a letter to the coroner saying, you know, these drugs, she died of deep vein thrombosis. These drugs cause deep vein thrombosis. What did the coroner do? They wrote back and said they were satisfied with what they had uh, concluded. Gabriel Myers, Gary Null talked about little children committing suicide. He was one. He was given drugs that caused suicide. He'd had a terrible childhood. Um, and he needed support, he needed help. He, he was given psych drugs instead, told there was something wrong with him rather than helping him deal with what happened to him. He was given a drug that causes little children to commit suicide, and he did at the age of seven. Dan Markingson, he was enrolled in a study and his mother desperately tried to get them to, to take him out, a, a, a dangerous study of neuroleptic drugs, and he was killed. So these are murders. 
psychiatry also, or psychiatric drugs, especially the uh, antidepressants, uh, cause people, cause these murders, as Gary Null said. Okay, what do we have across the street with psychiatry? A travesty. A farce. A travesty. Tomorrow, Vice President Biden is going to be talking. And they, you know, we have these tragedies, almost certainly caused by psychiatric drugs, and now there's a witch hunt. We're really facing a witch hunt. And Gary Null talked about the, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual being completely subjective. It's really no different than the spectral evidence, the spectral evidence that was used in the, the Salem witch trials to uh, convict people, women, who you know, really were not liked uh, and burn them. So I wrote a letter to the vice president explaining all this, and I got a form letter back. But now they're teaming up with psychiatry to come after people with psychiatric diagnoses. You know, and the National Institute of Mental Health says that half of the people at some time in their life will have a psychiatric, you know, a psychiatric diagnosis or should have one. So half the people are crazy. What's crazy is this country. Most of the children on Medicaid given these drugs, uh, it's not properly covered under Medicaid, and it's Medicaid fraud, and we've got a legal um, campaign going to sue the doctors for uh, committing this fraud, and it's on our website, psychrights.org. Yeah. Woo! Woo! I urge you all to work hard to defeat the Murphy Bill. HR 3717, so many, will lose their funding and clothes. It will expand forced treatment, locking up and violating the civil rights of thousands. It will take us back 30 years. Thank you so all. So much I love you all. child psychiatrists, labeling and drugging more children, a situation sure to result in more maimed, wounded, and in some cases, dead children. The fact that Vice President Joe Biden has been invited to give a lecture should come as a surprise to no one. We are being associated with violence, that violence is being used to deprive us of rights, that violence is being used to chemically modify our brains, and that violence is not connected to us. So, we have a need, and that need is to get politicians to realize that history will remember them as bigots for trying to lock us all up. They think they mean well. The men in that building think they mean well. I'm not here to tell you whether psychiatry is a fraud or not. I happen to smoke pot. I'm from Colorado. I like pot. I like to change my brain chemistry. Yay! If you like Zyprexa, I don't understand you, but if you like Zyprexa, have at it. What I'm against is someone coercing me, forcing me, or coming at me with a hypodermic needle. So there's progress in this fight against the Murphy Bill. There's progress at the national level. We just turned the tide in the state of Colorado, but they'll be back. Do you know what they did? I brought a, a nurse from Fort Logan which is the state mental hospital to talk about abuses and I bought, brought the PAMI lawyer who pointed out that the removal of imminent and the removal of the jury trial weren't even recommended by the task force they put together to change the civil commitment laws. They were slipped in by individual legislators. Remember the name of Democrat Beth McCann. Remember it for all time. This woman came for the jury trial for mental patients. She came for the jury trial for 26% of her voters. She's from a district where the last election she won with 83% of the vote. 83 minus 26 means we only need to get five more percent to terminate her time in the public sphere. And until we start to do things like that, 
until we start to make a point to politicians that coming for our rights will end their time in office, they will continue to think that they can scapegoat us. They need to be afraid of us like they're afraid of every racial min minority, and at 26% of the vote, we have the power to make them ask us what we want, not come at us with drugs. Everyone here, this is a start, but remember that statistic. It's right on the National Institute of Mental Health webpage. And remember the fact that these guys think because of the media perception, because of biases against our people, which are not legitimate, which are not based in science. I won't speak to the science of psychiatry, but the association with violence isn't true. We are six times more likely to be a victim. 96% of violent crimes are committed by people without a diagnosis, yet somehow we make up 26% of the population. And also, there's a recent study which said of people with mental illness who are arrested, fewer than 10% of those cases does the arrest have anything to do with their symptoms. They're telling lies, they're defaming us, and they're using it to take our civil rights. And we have the power to turn the tide. Together, we're a quarter of their voters and we can knock any single individual out of office we please. Spread the word, Beth McCann is to be an example. On May 8th, 2004, 27-year-old Dan Markington died by his own hand after being placed without consent into an AstraZeneca clinical trial of three powerful neuroleptic drugs. On December 13th, 2006, four-year-old Rebecca Riley took her last breath as heavy doses of Depakote, Seroquel, and Clonidine coursed through her veins, filling her lungs with fluid and shutting down her heart. On January 5th of this year, 18-year-old Keith Vidal, who was said to be having a so-called schizophrenic episode, was tased, pinned down, and shot to death by a police officer who allegedly declared, we don't have time for this. And for over a year, 15-year-old Justina Pelletier has been a psychiatric prisoner of the state of Massachusetts, separated from her family, her friends, and her home for every breath and action and uttered word controlled by this powerful, violent, dehumanizing mechanism of social control deceptively called psychiatry. This room of this massive building of people in here. We are here today for these individuals and for the millions of fellow Americans who've lost their identities, their freedoms, their sexuality, their physical health, their minds, and their lives to psychiatry. For the many who died 25 years early because of the damage caused from psychiatric drugs. For the youth of our country, whose natural, healthy, human experiences have been turned into symptoms to these drugs indefinitely, robbing them of their rights to, to grow up fully human. We are here today because we are the lucky ones to be free. Free to have and to use our voices, to, use our, to own our bodies, to be in this fresh air. Free to be human again after being so dehumanized by you, psychiatry. Your pockets bulging with profits reaped from our human fears and pain. You, psychiatry, a master exploiter of suffering, a pill hustler, a preacher of false promises. You, psychiatry, slave master of the human experience. At the heart of this dystopian age of psychiatric pharmaceutical control is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, a book of degradation and dehumanization and psychiatry's most effective enslavement apparatus. A slave is, quote, a person who is the legal property of another and is forced to obey them. Justina Pelletier and so many others are currently locked against their will on psych wards and in so-called group homes Clinical strangers, their indefinite masters, determining what chemicals yes. are to be put in their bodies, whether they'll have custody of their children, or be allowed to work, or see friends, or attend school, yes, and when they'll be able to be able to breathe fresh air again. Psychiatrists call these human beings their patients for whom they so-called care. There are two fundamental problems with the diagnostic and treatment uh, paradigm or system that we have in, in for mental health and psychiatry. The first is that the diagnostic system has no validity. They have been searching for biological causes of what gets diagnosed as mental illness for 150 years. And with increasingly sophisticated scientific you know, research methodology, and they've never found anything. 
And what we really instinctively know is that people go crazy because of what happens to them. And um, psychiatry just pretends that it's a medical condition rather than um, a psychological, emotional condition. And so their treatments are medical. And medicines are basically poison. And they may have some benefit. But in, for psychiatry, the benefit of the medicines are virtually non-existent for most people. And they are very harmful. So when you talk about the people that have the most extreme diagnoses, like especially schizophrenia and also, uh, say, the manic phase of bipolar disorder, the drugs that they use to treat them are keeping them from getting better. And there are very good studies that show that if we can, instead of saying everybody that comes into the hospital psychotic, which I like the term crazy better because it's, it's just, I think, a more natural term, um, and don't automatically put them on medicine, on these drugs, about 80% will get better and get on with their lives. Now there's about 20% we haven't figured out how to do that with. But what happens is once these people are put on drugs, most of them, their lives are ruined and their lifespans are shortened by 25 years. Christina Pelletier from uh, Connecticut has this rare condition called mitochondrial disease. And she was treated, and it's a very serious disease, and there are uh, some specialists, and she was seeing a specialist at Tufts who treated her very successfully to the point when uh, about 15 months ago when she was 14, she was a competitive skater. And she got the flu, which can be very uh, dangerous for someone with mitochondrial disease, and a, a doctor from Tusk had recently transferred to Boston Children's Hospital, who was a gastroenterologist and was familiar with uh, mitochondrial disease treatment. And when she got the flu, her doctor at Tufts recommended that she go there and see him. Well, before she got to see him, a um, psychiatric researcher who has this theory that 50% of the children that come into the hospital have are hypochondriacs. The, you know, the medical term now is somatoform disorder, you know, that it's in her head, decided, oh, there's no such thing as mitochondrial disease, and shipped her up to the uh, psychiatric ward. And uh, when the parents objected, petitioned the Massachusetts court to take uh, control and custody away from the parents. And she's been there for, I think, 15 months now. Um, and the court also put a gag order on the parents not to t t tell anybody about it. And they went along with it for a while. But starting, I think, last December 2013, the father especially um, started speaking out. He started violating the gag order and he was threatened with uh, contempt. Uh, and he he said, no, my daughter's uh, health is in danger, and he kept speaking out. And she's in a uh, wheelchair now. She can't even walk. I mean, and the judge is going along with this. I mean, it's just an outrageous situation. Psychiatric drugs are very harmful. Uh, the neuroleptics, such as Zyprexa, Seroquel, Abilify, Risperdal, um, I call them neuroleptics. They're marketed as antipsychotics, but they have antipsychotic properties for very few cause huge uh, physical damage. And as a result, people in the United States in the public mental health system diagnosed with serious mental illness have a 25-year shorter lifespan. So the neuroleptics are causing massive amounts of diabetes and other metabolic problems. Of course, that, uh, th that's a life-shortening uh, condition. There's a condition called uh, neuroleptic malignant syndrome that is potentially fatal, fatal very quickly. They cause um, extreme intestinal problems. Now, most people think of neurotransmitters uh, as mostly being in the brain, 
but the vast majority of it is really in your intestinal system, in your gut. And so, and they also affect that. And people very commonly get um, intestinal blockages and die from it. They go into an emergency room and up pops their psychiatric history and they say, oh, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, you, you're imagining this and they ship them off to the psych ward and die. Um, so they cause, cardi they cause cardiac problems. The, the neuroleptics cause this condition called tardive dyskinesia, which psychiatry ignored for 25 years. And when you see people, you know, with contorted faces and their tongues moving and their lips moving, it's, involuntar it's an involuntary movement. It's called tardive dyskinesia. Um, and it's a drug-induced Parkin Parkinism. And the... Neuroleptics basically block 70 to 90 percent of the neuroleptics in the frontal lobe, so they're a chemical lobotomy. The, in the limbic system, which is kind of the, the part of the brain that controls your emotions, um, uh, and in the uh, basal ganglia, which is your movement, you know, which controls your movement. And so it that's, what, that's what's causing this Parkinsonism. And it's very often permanent. W one of the drugs, or categories of drugs that people think are relatively innocuous are the benzodiazepines, the most famous of which is Valium, uh, Mother's Little Helper. Um, and these drugs are so incredibly addictive. They're more addictive than heroin. And people are not told this. Uh, the label says they should not be used for more than 30 days. They probably shouldn't be used more than seven days. Um, and some people, when they go, they just, if they go off them too fast, they'll have what's called a protracted withdrawal syndrome where they're are in real trouble for a real long time. And they can, they can cause psychosis too in the withdrawal. And, and people can get seizures from withdrawing from them. And they're, they're very, uh, very dangerous and addictive drug. And, and like all of these drugs, they, um, you become habituated to it over time so that your, your brain becomes used to it and compensates for it, so you have to take more and more to have the same result. Go back and look at all of these inexplicable mass murders, starting with probably Columbine, uh, I forget what year it was. Um, those that we know of, that they've given us information, have all been on antidepressants. And there's this marvelous book by uh, Peter Bregan, a, a dissident psychiatrist called Medication Madness that goes through all these drugs and shows how they cause suicide. And so there's, we're in a witch hunt mentality against people diagnosed with mental illness and, uh, and saying we need to put them in treatment when all of them were in treatment. They were treatment failures. And we don't, the, the problem isn't that they weren't in treatment, the problem is that it's not being recognized that these drugs are causing, it's a relatively small percentage, but there's millions of people on these drugs like Prozac and Paxil uh, and Zoloft that cause this, that, w that we're seeing this. Um, and so the one thing that people can agree on is to scape scapegoat uh, people diagnosed with mental illness, and so that's what's being done.